you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very good evening. On behalf of our Lord Mayor, Councillor Michael O'Connell, may I bid you all a Cade Meal of Fortune to the Lord Mayor's Community Heritage Concert here in our own magnificent City Hall. And I'm sure the Lord Mayor must be delighted to see such a packed house. I'm your host and local history narrator for this concert of music and song presented by the Barrack Street and Butter Exchange bands and their guests. And during the course of the evening, we'll celebrate the life of our beautiful city through the last century, as decade by decade, we remind you of some of the events and personalities that are part of our history and culture, with music appropriate to each decade where possible. So to get us quickly underway, we'll take the first two decades of the 20th century together, starting with the very first year of the century, 1900, when Queen Victoria conferred the title of Lord Mayor on Sir Daniel Hagerty, the then Mayor of Cork. And in 1902 and 1903, we had the World Industrial Exhibition on the Mardike at where is now Fitzgerald's Park. And in 1906, the National Monument on the Grand Parade was unveiled. Cork was and is an important port city, and the sea plays an important part in our history. In April 1912, the liner Titanic departed from Cove to founder with the loss of over 1,500 lives only four days later. And then in May of 1915, the Lusitania was torpedoed off the old head of Kinsale, and some 1,200 lives were lost. And survivors and dead were brought to Cove, and many of the dead are buried in a mass grave there. Of course, 1914 to 18 were the years of the First World War, and many Cork men gave their lives to make the world a better and a safer place. And in 1917, Henry Ford brought us his car factory, giving employment to thousands. And in the same year, one of Cork's most popular sons, Jack Lynch, first saw the light of day. And so we come to the 1920s. In the early years of that decade, our country was in turmoil. And the very first year, 1920, was a particularly tragic one for Cork. In that year, the Crown forces burned down most of Patrick Street and our City Hall. And on the 20th of March in the same year, our Lord Mayor Tomás McCurtain was assassinated. And just seven months later, his successor, Lord Mayor Tomás McSweeney, died on hunger strike. And you passed between the two sculptures that honour their memories as you entered this building tonight. And on the 2nd of August in 1922, another of Cork's greatest sons, Michael Collins, was killed in an ambush at Bale Blow. But on a lighter note, the Pavilion Cinema, the PAV, now the HMV Music Store in Patrick Street, opened its doors in March of 1921. And in 1926, Daly's Bridge, known affectionately to all Corkonians as the Shaky Bridge, was built across the Lee, joining the western end of Fitzgerald's Park with Sunday's Well. And the first ever talking picture, The Jazz Singer, starring Al Jolson, was shown to enthusiastic Cork cinema goers in the aforementioned Pavilion Cinema in the August of 1929. <laughs> so now, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the third decade of the century. In July of 1932, 12 years after the burning of the City Hall, the foundation stone of this elegant and gracious building was laid by Emma de Valera. And less than three years later, it was occupied by the corporation officials and staff. And it was also in 1932 that the Savoy Cinema opened its doors to cinema goers, the biggest and most luxurious cinema in the South, seeking 2,000 patrons. Those were the days, I tell you, how many of us now were up in the back row at the films there, watching the films, of course. <laughs> and I'm sure many will fondly remember in later years as singing along to its magnificent cinema organ, played by Fred Bridgman. And of course, later the Savoy was the venue for the world-renowned Cork Film Festival. In 1936, electricity replaced gas for the public lighting in our city. 
and the decade finished on a calamitous note with the outbreak of World War II in September of 1939. And once again, many Corkonians gave their lives in another terrible conflict. Well, now we're in the 40s. And the 40s, of course, the war years, bringing their own hardship with ration coupons. Remember the ration coupons? And gas masks. And a scarcity of everything. And here in Cork, we braved the war years with our usual stoicism. But there was a great sense of relief when the six years of war ended in May 1945. And the 40s, paradoxically, were great years for sport in Cork. In 1944, the Cork Hurlers pulled off an historic achievement by winning their fourth All-Ireland title in a row, a feat that the Kilkenny Hurlers tried but failed to surpass this year. And in 1945, the Cork footballers won their third senior All-Ireland. Of course, this was the era of Jack Lynch, the all-round sportsman, hurler and footballer from 1936 to 1950, winning a total of six All-Ireland medals. This decade had another special significance for Jack, because in 1948 he was elected to the Dáil and went on to serve in various ministerial offices, plus two terms as Taoiseach until his retirement 33 years later in 1981. And even when he was a Taoiseach, we always knew him as the real Taoiseach by him. In the same breath, sports-wise, we must mention another outstanding Cork sportsman of this period and beyond, the great Christy Ring, winner of eight. Eight All-Ireland medals, who is commemorated for all time by the bridge near the Opera House that bears his illustrious name. And the 40s had a certain significance for me personally, because as a very young lad, I appeared on stage for the very first time in 1944 in the old Opera House, in a play directed by one of Cork's most outstanding stage practitioners of the 20th century, the late James Stack. But appropriately enough, we find ourselves at the start of the second half of the century, the 1950s. And at this stage, I'm sure I'll be reviving memories for many of you. Like the rest of the country, Cork was still recovering from the war years, and the city witnessed a wave of emigrants boarding the Innisfallen at Penrose Quay, mainly bound for the factories of Dagenham. And when they returned home to Cork for their annual holidays each year, they were affectionately referred to as the Dagenham Yanks. In 1954, Cork motorists first saw the lights. They were red, green, and amber. At each street junction, yes, traffic lights had arrived, and with today's traffic, where would we be without them? Then in December of 1955, Cork sadly saw another light, the light of a great fire that lit up the night sky as our beloved Opera House burned to the ground. At the time, rehearsals were in progress for the Christmas panto, The Sleeping Beauty, directed by James Stack and due to star one of Cork's favourite comedians, the one and only Billa O'Connell. And as Billa stood in the pouring rain that night with many more of us, watching the great old building burn, he was heard to mutter ruefully, well, there goes my new sitting room suite. <laughs> And then in 1959, those stalwarts of Cork Theatre, James Ed Healy and Dan Donovan, formed the Southern Theatre Group, which was to premiere many of John B. Keane's plays. They began in the summer of 59, with Keane's very first play, Scythe, which packed the Father Matthew Hall for six weeks, and then went on to Dublin, where it was sold out before it opened. And I was privileged to have been very much a part of those halcyon days. We're in the 60s, and Cork in the 60s saw an upturn in the economy. There was good employment at Fords and Dunlops, Sunby Woolsey, Irish Steel, and her own dockyards, amongst others. And these brighter times were reflected in the emergence of the show bands, who surged in popularity. They packed the dance halls throughout the city and county, such as the Ark and the Majorca. 
and none were more popular than our own show band legends, the Dixies and the Regal. Yes, it did. Well, in 1961, Cork Airport opened, and many Corkonians had a crick in their necks from looking up at the planes flying overhead. And the following year, they lowered their sight lines because now they could watch TV for the first time. The President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, visited Cork in 1963 and received the freedom of the city. A few months later, he was assassinated in Dallas. And on October the 31st, 1965, our new opera house was officially opened by President Eamon de Valera and there was a gala concert featuring some of Cork's top entertainers. And those who couldn't get tickets for that big night were probably queuing up instead to see the new musical, The Sound of Music, at the Savoy. In July of 1969, Corkonians were glued to their TV sets to watch the first man walk on the moon. And a few months later, they watched those two Cork characters, Chan Maya, make their very first appearance on the box of Frank Hall. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we enter the 70s. And let us first continue on the theme of entertainment in Cork. The new opera house was in full swing and catered extremely well throughout the decade for the local popular taste with regular shows like The Swans, remember The Swans? And Summer Revels, and of course, the annual Panto, all featuring the cream of local talent, which we had a plenty. And in the Savoy, the Film Festival continued annually, and in 1978, we had the first Cork Jazz Festival, now an annual event of international fame. The 70s was a time of construction in Cork. In 1971, the new Parnell Bridge, replacing the old Victorian Cast Iron Bridge near the City Hall, was officially opened by the then Lord Mayor, Councillor Peter Barry. And this is an opportune moment to pay tribute to another of Cork's illustrious sons. Peter Barry's outstanding dedication to the service of his country and city, and in particular his work as Minister for Foreign Affairs in negotiating the Anglo-Irish Agreement, were duly recognised a short time ago by a special ceremony on this very stage when he was conferred with the freedom of the city. our decade of construction. In 1975, the new fire station in Anglesey Street was officially opened by Lord Mayor Pierce Wise. In 1977, the Trinity Footbridge by the Cork College of Commerce was opened by Cork's only Jewish Lord Mayor, Councillor Gerald Y. Goldberg. And in 1979, the Cork Regional Hospital, now the Cork University Hospital, was opened in Wilton by Antisha Jack Lynch. And it was in September of 79 that Pope John Paul II came on his papal visit to Ireland and thousands travelled from Cork to attend his Mass in Limerick. In 1970, a film musical starring Shirley MacLaine and Sammy Davis Jr. arrived in Cork. It was called Sweet Charity. So now we're in the 80s. And the decade of the 80s was not a particularly good one. Ireland was in an economic depression, and in Cork, many of the great traditional employers were forced to close, as they were unable to compete with foreign enterprises. The biggest blows came from the closure of Fords and Dublin's, <coughs> putting thousands out of work, and once again, many Corkonians were forced to emigrate. 1985 was probably the most memorable year of the decade in Cork for a number of reasons. It was the year of Cork 800 when our city celebrated the charter granted by King Henry II in 1185. In June of 1985, an Air India jumbo jet with when a terrorist bomb exploded on board crashed into the sea off the coast of Cork with the loss of 329 lives. And many of the bodies recovered from the sea were brought to the Cork Regional Hospital. And in August of 85, thousands of Cork people converged on Ballant Spittle to see a moving statue of the Blessed Virgin. 
In the final year of the decade, 1959, the Merchant's Key shopping center opened its doors to enthusiastic pop shoppers, thus ending the decade on a note of economic hope for our city. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the last decade of the 20th century. Well, the 90s, of course, saw the birth of the Celtic Tiger. In 1991, the former Ford and Dunlop premises were reopened as the Marina Commercial Park, with over 100 new industries setting up there. In the same year, Cork experienced a thrilling marine occasion with the Tall Ships Race visiting the port of Cork. And sporting-wise, the 90s got off to a great start with the Cork curlers and footballers achieving that memorable double in 1990. And then the Cork minor footballers won the All-Ireland in 1993, and in the same year, Cork City AFC won the Board Gosh League of Ireland Championship. And then, in, yes, indeed. Then in 1998, Cove's golden girl, Sonia Sullivan, thrilled us all with her remarkable 5,000 meter gold in the World Championships. <laughs> and the decade came to a close with the opening of the Lee Tunnel in 1999. It had cost a hundred million, and it was named after that great corkman, Jack Lynch. Yeah. Regrettably, <laughs> regrettably, Jack died in October of the same year, and thousands of Corkonians watched his cortege pass through the city streets on its way to St. Finbar Cemetery. And it's interesting to record that Jack never passed through the Lee Tunnel while he was alive what his hearse passed through when it arrived in Cork. And so we've come to the end of the 20th century. And looking back over the years, it's clear to see that Cork has come a long way indeed. We've seen many changes, and we've experienced many memorable moments. And now as we look to the future, we can feel assured that our beautiful university city is in safe hands as we pass the red and white colours to the next generation, who, like the generations before them, will have every reason to proudly sing Cork's praises in every corner of the world.